You are listening to Abra Money 3.0 Show, your guide to the future of all things money. In this episode, Abra founder and CEO Bill Barhide is in conversation with Mark Yusko, the founder, CEO, and chief investment officer at Morgan Creek Capital Management and a managing partner at Morgan Creek Digital. Bill and Mark talk about the investment case for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and why large investors like institutions and endowments are starting to pay attention to crypto. But before jumping in, remember, the information presented in this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any of the financial assets discussed. Any opinions expressed herein are subject to change. Neither Abra nor any of the participants in this podcast make any representation as to the suitability or appropriateness of these financial assets for individual investors. With that out of the way, on to the show. Hey, hello everyone. Bill Barhide here. Welcome to another exciting episode of Abra's Money 3.0. Really excited to have Mark on the show. We're going to get into a lot of topics ranging from uh, institutional investing in cryptocurrencies, Morgan Creek's philosophy, Mark's personal philosophy on on investing, his thoughts for 2020, and, and a whole bunch more. So let's get into it. Mark Isco, welcome to Money 3.0. No, Bill, thanks for having me. Great to be with you and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Hey, let's get right into it. So so we're in a bit of a, of a you know short-term run-up over the last few weeks. Those of you listening, uh, maybe in the future, it's, it's January 2020. We've seen a bit of a run-up in crypto. Do you think this is the year or this is the quarter where we start to see like true institutional money coming into the crypto world? Or does it happen like so gradually nobody notices it? I mean, what's your what's your thesis slash take on that? Yeah, look, I think it's like a kid growing. You know, when you're when you're hanging out with them, they don't seem to grow at all. And then someone who hasn't seen them for a while, like an in-law, says, oh my gosh, look how much you've grown. And I think the same thing's true here. Look, institutions act very slowly. They tend to be herd followers. Uh, so I, I don't know that there's any one quarter or one year where we're going to see any like big light switch go on and institutions suddenly invest. I think you know, the the leaders, you know, some of the big endowments and foundations that are normally the leaders in, in adopting new innovative strategies uh, have already dipped their toe in, uh, maybe half a toe. And uh, I think the big guys, you know, pension funds and sovereign wealth, I think they're still struggling with basically the small size of the overall asset class. So I think we'll make continued progress. I think the happening is a big deal. I think there's going to be a lot of activity this year, a lot of price movement. And uh, one thing you know about institutions, they definitely suffer from FOMO and they like to buy what they wish they would have bought. So they will be more active at the end of the year than the beginning. Okay. So let's, let's break that down. If you go to uh, a university endowment or a large uh, you know, commercial bank, I'm sure you're, you're talking to those folks all the time. Yeah. This is, this is probably a different discussion in 2020 versus 2015. Right, where oh, a lot of heard of Bitcoin. there was no discussion in 2015. Okay, right? so, so let's say return your calls. Right, right. So, so how? What's their perspective now? How? Obviously, some may, may have returned your calls over time, but how have things changed in those discussions over the last uh, three to four years? And what do you expect is going to happen now throughout the course of this year? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it's a really great question. I mean, six years ago. And uh, you and I have talked about this when we've been together in San Francisco. So six years ago, I came to San Francisco and hung out with my friend Dan Moorhead. And he said, hey, I'm shutting down my hedge fund. I'm going to start this fund to focus on blockchain technology and Bitcoin. I'm like, what? You can do what? Why would you, one, why would you send back a billion dollars? Two, what exactly is Bitcoin? Three, okay, I get blockchain infrastructure, technology, innovation. Okay, love that. I'm in. Now, that was the first of my many bad decisions, right? That fund's up 11x, Bitcoin fund's up 150x. So miss that one. So for two, the first two years, you know, a lot happened kind of from 2013 to 15. I wrote about Bitcoin in my quarterly letter. I write these long quarterly letters. I wrote one paragraph, one paragraph in a 40-page letter talking about Bitcoin might be an opportunity. It had just gone from $1,000 to 500 first quarter 15. And I had clients say they'd fire us literally say, don't talk about that stupid stuff. It's not a real asset. And so that's how little interest there was in 2015. You fast forward to first quarter 2017, you know, again, two more years, uh, that's when the FOMO was starting to begin. And you had seen a few 
Intrepid Endowments Foundation step up with Andreessen Horowitz or with Paradigm, the spin out from Sequoia. But there wasn't really a ton of interest yet. And, uh, and actually, actually, I'm, I'm early on Paradigm. Paradigm wasn't until later in the year. Um, but there really wasn't a lot of interest. And I, I use the example of back then, two years ago, we launched Morgan Creek Digital, subsidiary, operating subsidiary, Morgan Creek Capital. And uh, 90% of the people we called on, existing clients, new prospects, 90% said, don't darken our door. Don't even talk to us. Now, the ones that did meet with us, 90% of them said, no, not interested in your first fund, uh, you know, go away. So that's 1%. That's a tiny number. Now, here we are two years later, 2019, 20, and now 70% still won't return our calls, but that's a yeah. 3x increase. Right? Right. That's three times as right. many prospects. So that's, that's actually yep. pretty good. And we yeah. have been successful in getting six institutions across the line into our venture funds. Um, but look, we're, we're so early. We're so early in this transition, uh, which is awesome. It's huge. Yeah. So, so now when you talk to an endowment or, or a bank, I mean, are they, are they interested in cryptocurrencies or is it more about, let's talk about blockchain still, or is it, let's talk about stable coins. I mean, what do you, what do you think is really driving, if anything, their interest in our world today? Yeah, look, I, I think it's, it's, it's a great question again. And there are three answers to the three subparts of the question. So I would say the bulk of people are like, don't talk to me about cryptocurrencies. That's speculation for the drug dealers and, and the bad people out there. And I, I don't really want to talk about cryptocurrencies. They're too volatile. You know, I'm a fiduciary. I can't have that in my portfolio. Well, in fact, you know, uh, the first client, first big client we got into our venture fund. So we, we started first with a venture capital fund to do you know, infrastructure investments in the underlying companies that build out the infrastructure, you know, like Abra and others. Um, and people were trying to build out awareness and, and the use case for, for crypto. Um, later, we did a, a joint venture with Bitwise and did a, a digital asset index fund because some of our clients said, hey, I, I want some crypto exposure too. But our, our first client for the venture fund said, you know, after a two and a half hour board meeting, the guy goes, so wait a minute, I got to go tell my guys that I just committed their pension to drug dealer money? I'm like, no, no, that is not what you're going to tell them. Okay, what you're going to say is, you know, faced with the future of traditional assets, 2% from bonds, low single digits for stocks, we have to make seven and a half as fiduciaries. We've got to find alpha. We've got to invest in innovation. We've got to look at venture capital. So that's what we're doing. He says, okay, good. I can get behind that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a small number of people, very small, who are willing to look at blockchain infrastructure and invest in innovation. Then there's a small number, even smaller, that are willing to put a little bit and speculate in cryptocurrency itself. And I think the thing that people just don't want to talk about yet as institutions is, you know, how does this whole ecosystem change? And, you know, what we believe, and I know you, you believe the same thing, right? That every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity is going to be tokenized. It's all going to be digital. They're going to be the same assets. They're just going to be digital and cryptographically secure. And so everything in a fiduciary's portfolio is going to go this direction. So they better get ready. Yeah. Now you've actually almost structured your entire life around this, right? This idea. I mean, talk about Morgan Creek, right? You've got you've got a venture arm. You've got like a I think capital markets arm. How, how does this all fit together then with with this broader broader thesis of crypto that you're talking? Yeah. Look, it's, it's been a, it's been a great journey and. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, we launched Morgan Creek Capital. You know, we started as an advisory firm. We did some fund of funds. We did some direct investing, did some co-investing. Uh, we still have many of those businesses. We still run private equity fund of funds. We still run a Chinese growth equity fund. We still run an emerging markets fund, a long, short uh, hybrid hedge fund. But over the last six years, I've gone from spending 0% of my time in the crypto space and blockchain space to probably admittedly 75, 80% of my time. And people say, wow, that's crazy. Why would you do that? I'm like, well, look, I think this evolution of technology as we go from you know, mainframes in the 50 and 54 to microchip in 68 to personal computers in 82, internet in 96, mobile net in 2010 to the trust net 
or the blockchain era or the internet of everything in 2024, which is still four years away, I think it's the greatest wealth creation opportunity I'll see in my lifetime. So we are spending a lot of time. I went out and I partnered with some guys to build Morgan Creek Digital. We run a uh, venture fund. So we, we raised a uh, venture fund one two years ago, about a $40 million fund. We're out raising our second fund, a $250 million venture fund, uh, closed on about $65 million of that. Um, led by these two big pension funds out of DC and first pension funds to cross the chasm. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that. Yeah. And we also did the digital asset index fund to get people some exposure to liquid crypto. And as I said, we have capital markets activities. We make direct co-investments um, across the space and, and we're looking to help any way we can advance the ecosystem. Yeah. And so you're clearly not busy enough and, and you need some work to do. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get you a list right away of, of how you can help the ecosystem. Well, I appreciate that. Maybe I, can, maybe I can volunteer to work with you guys a little bit. That'd be good. Yeah, that's phenomenal. I mean, you know, you've got to be one of the busiest groups in, in the crypto space with your hands and in, in, in incredibly uh, interesting things. So uh, talk to me a little bit about your international perspective on all of that, right? So, so everybody... A lot, most people here in SF, where I am, are very U.S. But they're very SF, Silicon Valley centric. But but obviously, it's mostly U.S. centric. I mean, what's your? Uh, this is obviously a global phenomenon, which is one of the things that excites me the most about it. And so, what what's your take on on that? What do you see differently uh, in your travels outside the U.S. versus in the U.S. And what what do you? How do you think it's going to evolve over time? No, look, I mean, uh, you know, you personally in Abra, you know. Um, as a company, have been so great in thinking about this this globalization and and really embraced the global nature of, of this asset uh, or these assets, uh, plural. Uh, what I think is really amazing, right, is Americans we're, we're we're really funny, right? We suffer from home market myopia. You know, we think all the smart people live in America. You know, you're you where you live, they think all the people live in one zip code, right? And you know, I'm like, no, there, there's some pretty smart people in Japan and China and in Russia and Estonia and, and some other places, you know, parts of Africa, Latin America. There are smart people all over the place. That's and right. uh, I've been blessed. You know, I say I had the best job in the world um, for my career. I get to travel around the world talking to the smartest people in the world about investments. It's awesome. And, and I've been in, you know, every continent and many, many countries. And I spent a lot of time, to your point, outside the US. I was just down in, in uh, Brazil and in Rio, uh, you know, talking to cab drivers about cryptocurrency and, and uh, talking to asset managers about stocks and bonds and uh, talking to people about political. You know, they've got their version of Trump down there that everybody actually loves. It's interesting. Um, so I, I think what is really important about this point that you bring up is one, home market myopia is very dangerous, right? You should never have the bulk of your assets in the market in which you live, right? We live in a global world, there are global opportunities, and it's not just Americans, right? The people in Japan have too many Japanese stocks, people in the UK have too many UK stocks, um, people in China have too many Chinese assets. So it's, it's, it's all of us suffer from it. But it's very dangerous to your wealth long term. And if you think about the biggest opportunities in the world, they tend to, to come out of these, these areas of innovation. And innovation doesn't just happen in Silicon Valley. It doesn't just happen in the United States. Some of the best innovation in, on the planet today is happening in China. Uh, they are crushing us in things like AI, 5G, uh, South Korea by far the dominant player, and, and Japan too, dominant players in, in crypto in terms of innovation and, and uh, some of the early wealth creation. One of our biggest wins was the first Korean uh, crypto exchange. So it's cool. Uh, yeah. Yep. yeah. And, you know, you think about this, this set of opportunities, you know, you, you look at a country like Venezuela, where, you know, the dictator playbook, they, you know, the dictator comes in, he puts all the assets with his cronies, then he devalues the currency, steals all the wealth. And, and the only way to protect yourself was to move out of boulevards into something like, like Bitcoin. So there are these incredible new use cases for blockchain technology, for cryptocurrency all around the world and other places are seeing, you know, what I, what I marvel at is I think the U.S. is, you know, high teens percentage of uh, crypto activity. Yet we think we're everything. You know, like no, you know, it's we're we're a small minority percentage of the global activity, and uh, yet we think we're the big dogs. So we're important, and we have lots of important companies here. We have a lot of important entrepreneurs, and you've backed some, we've backed some, um, and I think that's 
going to continue to evolve, but I think you have to have a global global perspective. I think you have to uh, look beyond your borders. And the thing that I love about blockchain in particular is it will create a borderless world, right? We will go to a truly borderless world. Yeah. Yeah. Focusing in on that, on that, that borderless world, let, let me, let me talk about the venture side of the business for a second. Do you see uh, the opportunities more in, let's call it like enterprise blockchain? Do you think more about consumer banking, finance, DeFi? Do you think about all of it? What, what are the, the exciting bets that, or what are the bet, the potential bets that you're excited about? I guess the better way. Yeah, look, I, well, we think about all of it and, you know, you know, we focus on infrastructure, picks and shovels. I'm a, I've always been a picks and shovels guy. You know, my pinned tweet, you know, my Twitter account at Mark Yusko is, you know, you make the most wealth or the most wealth is created when you invest in something you believe in before everyone else even understands it. Mm-hmm. And that's been true forever, right? Yep. Whether it's personal computers, the internet, mobile net, you know, when Google bought Android in 2005, people laughed at them, Right. When Jeff Bezos you know, started AWS, Business Week wrote a story saying, hey, Jeff, go mine the store. Don't waste your time on that stupid stuff. So people don't understand true innovation. And the greatest investors always overweight innovation. So investing in innovation is, is really important. So you know, I've made part of my career uh, a huge overweight to uh, venture capital, to innovation, uh, and as we've built out Morgan Creek Digital, our primary focus is on investing with great innovators and great leaders, great technologists. So we invest across everything from tools to enterprise solutions to exchanges to um, you know providers of, of financial services to DeFi, anything that we think is going to further the adoption and, and broaden the use cases of, of both the technology and the things that have been developed so far. Yeah, but the yeah. way the way you do that, and, and the way I really think about it, is you know the thing I'm most excited about in our portfolio is this company called Figure, right? I mean, they are an extraordinary company that has found an extraordinary use case for uh, and that applies to a very very large market. In essence, uh, they, you know, they're a lending company. They're going to do. They've done the first loans on the blockchain, uh, but more than that, right? A lending company, you know, like Lending Club or whatever, that could be a four or five billion dollar company. Great exit, like a plaid or one of these other th- recent deals. Fine, that's great. But if you disrupt and recreate DTCC, okay, DTCC, which is the backbone of all securities transactions, uh, you know, does one point eight quadrillion dollars of volume a year. I don't even know how to write end. that number. I, I, I don't even know how to write that number. That means. Too, too many zeros. <laughs> right. And so you take a little piece of that and. You know, a company that that recreates that on blockchain, you know, Providence blockchain, it has the potential. I'm not saying it will be, but it has the potential to be a hundred billion dollar company. Yeah, yeah. No so, kidding. yeah. So, so we're excited about that. You know, we have an investment in Coinbase, and and that, we think that's an interesting uh, transaction. You know, another thing we really like, in, in you know, to your point, the DeFi space. Uh, it's not absolutely DeFi, but but kind of. Um, creating financial services on blockchain is a company called BlockFi, right? They mm-hmm. they do some really interesting things, and you know, don't call them a bank. It's like it's like QE today. It's not QE, but it is QE. It's like okay, can't call them a bank, but really they're doing banking on blockchain. Yep. yep. So so we have this thesis here, which I think marries really well to what you're talking about, and we talk about exponential technologies here, right? You probably heard of Singularity University. They talk about it. Uh, there's some other professors that talk about it, and you know, my, my take is, is that as human beings, we're not wired to think in exponential terms well or easily, right? I know, I'll, I'll summarize. We suck at exponential yeah. math. We, we oh, do. no, no, no. Oh, Compound yeah. That's interest. a technical term, Bill. Yeah, exactly. Compound interest is the easiest example for most people to get their arms around. P- people who've done it get it, but they get it after the fact. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm really glad I did that. You know, it's hard to explain to kids who are in the here and now but then, you know, that's just a simple example. Like I, I had a, somebody asked me last night if they should short Tesla. And I said, look, I don't do that anymore. I don't have the time to sit down and evaluate short term uh, thinking on stocks. But let me put it to you this way. Right. People are grossly underestimating how huge the transformation is from traditional combustion engines to electrical. And we haven't even started yet. And they have a three year head start and they've had a 
it seems like their head start has been forever and nobody's even come close still. And so, but again, it's a, it, it, when you look at every aspect of that, there's exponential technology in batteries, there's exponential technology in supply chain. And, and it seems to me that the same thinking is going to apply to the world of cryptocurrencies, moving money around, bypassing traditional banks using blockchain, uh, smart contracts that allow cross-border transactions and supply chain to happen uh, in a way that, that, that wasn't possible before. And, you know, to your earlier comment, it's going to be like, before you know it, all of a sudden, it's going to be 15% of transactions and then 20%, just like online advertising, right? I, I, mean, look, I, I mean, your point is so well taken. And I think I'll get this right. But, but you know, people get the gist, even if they prove me and say, oh, Mark, you were wrong. But the gist is, if you take 30 linear steps, you get across a room, you take 30 exponential steps, you go around the world twice. Yeah, that's right. So... Um, the thing is about that, that we're, we're on the verge of, I have, the, I have this great chart and it shows the internet 1.0. There was a pretty significant amount of wealth created in internet 1.0. Companies like Intel and Microsoft and Cisco, they did okay, right? People made a lot of money. And, you know, it looks like this incredible parabolic growth curve. And then you plug in internet 2.0 right? With the mobile net. And you look at companies like Facebook and Alibaba, and suddenly that little internet 1.0 looks like a, a little blip on, a ma on, on the graph. It's just a little tiny beginning on the left-hand side. And then internet 2.0 starts to go really parabolic. Well, internet 3.0, which is where cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology starts to take over and all things you've been talking about and all things you're actually doing at Abra, all this thing starts to go up at an alarmingly fast asymmetric asymptotic rate. And then the size of the area under the curve dwarfs internet 1.0 and internet 2.0. So I say all the time, this is the greatest wealth creation opportunity I'm going to see in my lifetime. And it's just math. And I, I actually have a hashtag for it, just math, right? This is not rocket science. It is literally just simple, as you said, exponential math. The problem is the human brain isn't wired for exponential math. And if I ask someone what's two times two, they'll say four. If I say what's 17 times 21, they're like, um, um, that's the limit. That's the proven limit of human intelligence. Mm -hmm. So how do you think people are at nonlinear you know, regression or exponential you know, uh, algebra? It's just, it just doesn't work. And so as we think about why do most people miss these huge investment opportunities, um, you know, who, who bought Amazon when they went public and held it for the last 20 years. Jeff and his mom and dad, that's it, right? Because nobody believed it. And every time it went down a little bit, they, they bailed. So when was the good time to sell Amazon? Never. So same thing with Bitcoin, right? It's been the most volatile asset you know, over the last 10 years. It's also been the best performing. Now, I actually don't include the first five years. That was mostly drug dealers and a few other people. But the last five years, those are real. That's a real asset class. You could have put $6.7 billion into the asset class, which is 1% of all endowment and foundation assets over the last five years. And the endowments would have earned 9.2 instead of 7.2. And had it gone to zero, which was a non-zero probability five years ago, they would have gone to seven. So that's a mm -hmm. 10 to one upside downside ratio Incredible. as an investment. Yeah. And you just got to get there. So hashtag get off zero. As a fiduciary today, as an investor, you cannot have zero exposure to this asset. You yeah. can't. Yeah. I'm sensing a little excitement here. So <laughs> that's great. let's let's uh, leverage that excitement to, to to make it real. So it's it's January 2020, uh, possibly February by the time people are listening to this. Uh, what are your top three uh, theses or predictions or whatever you want to call them for 2020 yep. uh, as it relates to this world? Yeah, look, I think um, so one and everybody's talking about it. And, you know, there are two two camps. One is. Uh, it's already priced in, and the other is, oh, it's going to be huge, and it's the halvening, or mm -hmm. the how thinning, as I like to call it, in <laughs> deference to our, our dearly departed brother yep. in crypto, yep. um, maybe Satoshi Nakamoto, um, if we want to go deep in the conspiracy rat hole. So, uh, but look, the, the interesting thing about this is if you look over time, uh, what is mining? You know, it's an unfortunate term, right? Mining implies digging and, and production. That's not really not what mining is. Mining is simply pointing computing power to secure a computer network. And the Bitcoin blockchain is the most secure network in the world. Uh, never been, you know, one fraudulent transaction ever, you know, 
hundreds of billions of transactions, not one fraudulent transaction. And uh, it's the most secure and most powerful computing network on the planet. Why? Because people are compensated for contributing hash power or computing power to the network. So every time the halvening occurs, what is the halvening? It's the reward that's paid to miners per every 10 minute block. Okay, gets cut in half. So it was 50, then 25, then 12 and a half, and it'll go to six and a half. Every time that happens, if you think about it, just the math is that the price needs to adjust to compensate the miners because the miners' costs are basically fixed for electricity and, and cost of hardware. And so the price will rise. And as soon as that adjustment occurs, what happens? People see movement. And since you know, the, you know, the ecosystem is still mostly guys, and guys are hunter gatherers, and we only see things if they're moving. It's like my wife says, you know, go get the ketchup. I open the refrigerator door. There's no ketchup in here. I can't see it because it's not moving. I'm moving. So <laughs> yeah, if it were moving, I could see it. Exactly. But so what happens is the FOMO kicks in, and we're going to get another spike uh, after the happening this year, probably in price. And you know, could we break the all time highs? I, I actually think we could. So I think this is going to be a very exciting year for the price of the Bitcoin network. I don't think really anything fundamentally will change because fundamentally all it does is get better every day, every week, every month. The fundamentals just get better and better, more adoption, more uses, more wallets. So I think that's that's one thing I believe. Second thing I believe is that um, you know the the expansion of use cases uh, of blockchain technology broadly, and you know specifically things like Ethereum um, and and other DeFi related projects, I think will start to rapidly expand again to your exponential point is it's not a linear expansion. It's an exponential expansion, but at the beginning of exponential growth, it, it kind of looks linear. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel that big, but as you start to get further out on the curve, the, the, the asymptotic movement starts to increase. And I think that'll happen. And I think we'll see some really exciting uh, projects and, and use cases. And then third I do think to your first question, I think we will finally start to see uh, a little bit of what I like to refer to as the great wallow money. Uh, there is a massive amount of capital in institutions uh, that these fiduciaries are struggling and they're faced with this, this very sad dilemma that you know we know the return on bonds for the next 10 years. You know, 10 year yield is what you make for the next 10 years. So that's 2%. We know that equities are highly stretched in valuation and likely the, the forward-looking returns are, are going to be subpar, probably low single digits. And we know that the illiquidity premium, while it's still positive, is probably going to be challenging for everybody to be 100% illiquid yep. because they have to pay for the withdrawals from the, from the pensions and things. Yep. So I do think that, that a focus on innovation, and particularly innovation as an asset class, is going to continue to rise, and that's going to draw people into this space. And people are going to finally, one, return our calls and listen to our pitch, but also they're going to see the benefit of focusing on that innovation, focusing on that blockchain is a technology. It's a technological evolution. It's not revolutionary. It's evolutionary. And it truly is just an operating system. The same way that DOS was the operating system for personal computers, TCP IP is the operating system for the internet, you know, iOS and Android are the operating system for the mobile net, and blockchain is the operating system for the internet of everything or the internet of value. And probably the, the three point or three B on three A is maybe the biggest realization will be that the same way that the internet changed information over IP. Or, you know, and then voice over IP, so voice over internet protocol, money over internet protocol, people will finally have that aha eureka moment and realize this really is the biggest thing technologically we'll probably see in our lifetime, which is the complete transition of money and how we think about money. And we move to a borderless world where there's frictionless transactions and it's all... Um, enabled by this incredible technology that allows us to move anything of value over internet protocol without a trusted third party, without an intermediary, without a rent-seeking intermediary. So, you know, the banks are all excited because they're all reporting record earnings. Yeah, right. It's not record earnings. They were handed money 
by the Tax Act for contributing to Trump's campaign. And so now they get to report one year of good earnings. Woo, big deal. Okay. Their long-term prospects are really less bright given that they can be disrupted mightily by blockchain. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think, uh, you know, you mentioned figure, uh, very bullish on that space. I mean, Abra uh, is also, you know, we very quietly already lend in the background, we're doing work in that area. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities in DeFi. And to me, it's like an unbundling almost of the banks. Yes. Back in favor of the consumer, right? You think about fractional reserve banking, that system is not set up really to help the consumer. It's really set up to optimize profits for the banks at the risk of the of the consumer because the banks- Wait, 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 Bill, Bill, Bill wait, wait. You're, you're telling me that, that the Rothschild cabal that has been in charge of the banking system for about 400 years is self-interested? That they don't have the consumer's best interest at heart, and that you know from 1776 to 1913, a dollar was worth a dollar in the United States. A little fluctuation around the wars, but basically it was worth a dollar. And since the creation of the Fed, which is basically just a copy of the Rothschilds' original investment bank, I mean uh, original central bank in the Netherlands, uh, the dollar's gone from a dollar to five cents. Yeah. So it's just a stealing of wealth and loading it up into the banks. So I, c- I could not agree with you more. And this is the, you know, banks have been under attack for a decade with fintech. Yep. And that's been great. And it's taken, you know, this whole idea of peer-to-peer activities to a new level. But blockchain takes it to a whole new level and gives us weapons to finally put banks in their proper role, which is custodians and safekeepers, not profit machines to enrich the, the 1%. Yep, totally. I couldn't agree more. I mean, we could do a whole other episode. We should. Uh, we but should. I don't even feel strongly about that. I want to get a panel together of people who are looking at this whole unbundling and historical kind of perspective on banking and do nothing but like have a crazy conversation just on this this, this unbundling and his and how we historically got here. Oh, I'm totally in. We could do we could do a five hour marathon. Yeah, totally. Five one hour totally. shows. We and it would that. be legendary. It would be so, awesome. Uh, you know, c- kind of related to this. I mean, you, you you're online. I see you uh, at Mark uh, Yusko on Twitter. Uh, obviously, Pomp, your your partner and, and Mark yeah. Bill is is super active. He runs uh, you know uh, one of the most popular podcasts in in, in crypto. Uh, I think it's called On the Chain. I've been on twice. I think I'm actually the only person who's been on twice. You uh, are. And and um one of my questions is you know you guys you obviously uh espouse bitcoin 24 7 when you're online and and you do a fantastic job of that but you also manage to stay out of this kind of hyper maximalist discussion about everything else is a waste of time yeah the only thing that matters is bitcoin and obviously that's there's no way you guys aren't doing that without having a conscious discussion that you know we're not going to get in the middle of that. It's very obvious that you guys have been a, done a good job of that. And you know, what is your thought on that? I mean, you know, it's clearly you have you have you know Pomp has fans who are maximalists who think everything else is bullshit. Uh, but at the same time, he doesn't put himself in the middle of that fray. Like he's he's okay to talk about a digital dollar, whereas a lot of those maximalists think that's just a complete waste of time. Yeah. You know, look, I, I well, one, I really appreciate the feedback and I appreciate the kind words and. And look, you know, there's a reason that I teamed up with Pomp, right? I mean, I met Pomp two and a half years ago. We were both investing in this little company called Lyft. We were one of the early private investors and we kind of met, you know, 20 minutes. We didn't really spend much time together. And uh, then I heard him on a podcast, actually, um, mm-hmm. with, with O'Shaughnessy. And I was like, oh, that guy's kind of smart. I, sh- I should spend more time with him. So uh, I started following him on Twitter and I went like, like, like. Uh, I seemed to like everything he tweeted. And I was like, and then I started thinking, I would have said that. Wait, I did say that. And I would say it's like talking to myself, a younger, better looking version, but it's like talking to myself. And so I got to spend time with him. So I spent time with him. One hour turns into three, three turns into eight, eight turns into five days. And then it's like, we got to work together. And I think the big thing that we bring to one another is, you know, I'm the old guy, I have the gray hair and the wisdom. And he's the young guy with the enthusiasm and the tech expertise. But together, I think what we what we've created is to your point is this platform that pushes for the development of the ecosystem mm-hmm. but recognizes that at the root of that is this technological evolution and there are different components of it. For example, Bitcoin we do believe is the ultimate monetary system. We think it will long term be a 
replacement for fiat currencies by and large. And that terrifies the governments, right? Because they don't want to lose control of their central banking cabal. But in the short term, they're going to fight back and they're going to create digital currencies. And we think they should create digital currencies. And look, I always say, I hate to quote Ricky Bobby, but if you ain't first, you're last. And whoever is first to create a digital global currency will have the potential to disrupt the US dollar as global world reserve currency. I think China will be first. I think they will win. And uh, I think that's been their plan all along, right? They're, they're you know, planning in 30-year increments, and we can't think in three-minute increments in the United States. Yeah. So uh, maybe three hours. But yeah. um, so I think that's part of it. The second part of it is you know, we focus on venture capital. And we focus on investing in innovation. And what we realized, and Pomp was very vocal about this a number of years ago, that, look, the ICO thing was destined to be a disaster because, look, all an ICO really was, was crowdfunding of a pre-seed stage idea. Mm-hmm. Pre-seed stage investments have a 95, 97, 99% failure rate. That's not surprising. Yeah. And that's what they should have. Because right. the 1% or 3% that survive become awesome. I mean, 100 baggers, you know, 200 baggers, whatever. That's the whole idea of pre-seed stage investing. Mm-hmm. But to think that that all of those altcoins were somehow or utility tokens were somehow going to be successful was crazy. Yeah. And everyone says, well, they're all crypto. No, they're not. A cryptocurrency is a decentralized currency that can act as a store of value or a medium exchange. There are about a dozen. Okay, Bitcoin's the by far the biggest. And I think will be the long-term winner because of the law of increasing returns. Paul Romer won the Nobel Prize explaining why that works. And Ethereum, I think, becomes the www dot of the internet of value. I think it's it's like TCPIP. Uh, and I think there'll be other winners like Polkadot or Cosmos or others. And we'll create a stack, a protocol stack, just like the internet protocol stack. Uh, you know, there used to be 80 internet protocols, eight zero. Today, there's five that matter. Mm-hmm. You know, HMTP, SMTP, or HTTP, SMTP, FTP, www. and uh, TCPIP. That's it. And everything that is built on top of that created lots and lots of wealth in terms of applications and products and services. And I think the same thing is going to happen in, in um, blockchain technologies or protocols. So, but we can have these, what seem to be disparate views because we want to invest in it all, right? We want to invest in pre-seed stage deals, but we don't do it in the right structure in a venture capital structure. We want to invest in liquid protocols. We want to do it in the right structure, like digital asset index fund. We want to invest side by side in growth equity companies like your, like yours, right? We, we want to be in the right structures and encourage entrepreneurs and encourage the technology and encourage the growth because look, the genie's out of the bottle. This is not going away. Everyone says, oh, it's going to zero. It's not going to zero, right? It's just not. And no matter how many times it goes down 50, 60, 70%, again, it's just like Amazon. Amazon, 20 years, been a public company. It's had a double digit drawdown every single year. Average drawdown, 31%, twice down more than 90. Wow. Okay volatility is your friend in wealth creation. Everyone fears it, but you want to seek it. And you want to have the ability to make lots of small investments. Some of them go to zero, but you double down and triple down and quadruple down on the winners. And you ride these winners to great, great wealth creation by, again, focusing on innovation, innovation, invest in innovation, treat it as an asset class, and then partner with the smartest, most passionate entrepreneurs. That's awesome. I mean, I'm going to we got to use that uh, in our in our. Uh, oh, feel free! In our feel uh, free here for people investing. I mean, that's just fantastic, well said advice. So, if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm convinced that after this, uh, which I'm sure our thousands are going to be, that Morgan Creek should be investing in my company, where do I go as an entrepreneur? Do I is there a website? Do I just go to yeah? yeah. So, lots of ways to get to us. Um, so, Morgan Creek Cap C A P dot com um, is the website. Um, you know, email, you know, just musco at morgancreekcap.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I don't really, not very good at email. I kind of suck at email, actually. Technical term. Uh, I'm actually pretty good at DM on Twitter. Not not great, but I'm better at that. So at Mark Yusko, you DM me. Um, yeah, it's a good way to find me. And Pomp's easy to find too, but he's, he's a little more popular than I am. So, uh, but no, we're out there. We want to be reached. You know, we haven't talked about our other partner, Jason Williams. Um, so those, the three of us are on Twitter a lot. We're easy to find. Uh, but seek us out. Look, our, our job is to partner with great entrepreneurs. And you know, I've, I've made this a habit for the 
30 years I've been doing this that uh, I want to talk to everybody because I never know when the next great idea is going to come through the door. I don't have a monopoly on good ideas. In fact, I don't have lots of good ideas myself. I like to borrow or steal good ideas from good, smart people. Um, but I do have, I, look, I had a great mentor, uh, very lucky. Uh, I had a great mentor, Julian Robertson, famous hedge fund manager. And, you know, he, he's mentored so many great people and I've interviewed them all. And I asked him, what separates Julian from the other great hedge fund managers? What makes him one of the best of the best? And every single one said the same thing. And I've, I've tried to emulate it. They said he has an uncanny knack for um, pressing his winners, right? Mm. When he's wrong, he admits it and gets out to live to fight another day, but he will double up. And that ability to double up and to press your winners and to really ride you know, the innovators and the wealth creators uh, is an amazing uh, thing. And if you think about your own portfolio, right? That's what we should all do, right? We should all make lots of little bets and then we should press the ones that are winning and we should not worry about the ones that go away. Um, but most people do the opposite, right? right? They water their weeds and pull their flowers because they're so worried they're going to lose their gains. So. Right, right, right. Fantastic. Okay. So Mark Yusko, thank you so much uh, on behalf of the uh, Money 3.0 ABRA community. This has been awesome. Uh, one of our best episodes, I believe. And uh, can't wait uh, for people uh, to be hearing this. And um, so, yeah, thank you so much for joining. And let's wrap it there. Uh, this was a really exciting episode. Thanks again for joining. No, uh, Bill, thanks for having me. Look, I, I, I love doing podcasts with really smart people who have prepared in advance, have great questions, and, and I could talk to you all day. It was just so much fun. Well, we're going to take you up on that. We're going to have you back. We're also going to revisit the predictions. We, we like that. So, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it there. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. And we'll see you next time on Money 3.0. Thanks again for listening to the Abra Money 3.0 show. We hope you liked this episode as much as we did. If so, please subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and download the Abra app wherever you get your apps. Thanks again.